Welcome, this is a recorded session of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Conference of the PKI Consortium. This conference would not have been possible without our sponsors in Trust, HID Global, and PQ Shield, and the organizational support of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Working Group of the PKI Consortium, in particular in Trust, Logius, TNO, and CWI. Next speaker is uh, Jérôme, and Jérôme is a cryptographer at the French cybersecurity agency ANSI. He's involved in the writing of national security requirements in asymmetric and in asymmetric and quantum code cryptography. Uh, is that still the remote control for the, for the side? Ah, it's over there. So thanks for the introduction. Uh, so um, uh, I'm very happy to speak here. In particular, I'm very happy to speak right after Stefan, uh, because then I can make this presentation kind of uh, spot the difference game, because uh, I hope that you will see that uh, the MC position is very similar to the BSI position on uh, most topics. So this will be kind of a uh, spot the difference. And in particular, I'm also happy to say that I'm also a doctor in pure mathematics, and I also like modular forms. So yeah, that's a, you won't find a difference here. <laughs> Um, and so, and I also hope, to, uh, um, um, with respect to the presentation by Andrea, uh, I'm sorry, Andrea, that I hope to make you lie on some points in particular on the fact that there is no common use strategy because, um, as you will see, there will be very few differences between NC and BSI position, and we are trying to work together to set up some kind of uh, European position. Right now, it's on the national policy, but we hope to make everything convert. Uh, so, uh, I will start by, uh, uh, I think I don't need much of the information because uh, everything here has been said a lot of times already. Uh, so I will go very fast on the, the first part. I, as you see, the writing is on the wall for classical cryptography. Uh, so uh, what can a uh, quantum computer, um, a big enough quantum computer do? I hope that everybody here already knows what the big concerns are. Uh, the big one here is really the short one, short algorithm. We are not so worried about the Robert algorithm and uh, we are not so worried either about the limited other special cases, of course, uh, there could be more, but for now the threat is mainly short algorithm which basically breaks all uh, implemented, currently implemented uh, um, asymmetric cryptography. So what is the threat right now? So right now, as far as I know, cryptographically useful quantum computers they don't exist, but they probably don't exist right now, so I would be happy to have um, a source for the probability of the 1 over 7. I don't uh, I'm not uh, confident enough to give the probability myself, but I'm confident enough to say that the probability over the next 10 years, say, is higher than the usual probability that we consider in cryptography, so we must take this threat into account. And of course, uh, there are also the, um, the two threats that were outlined by Stefan. The first one is that uh, the deployment times are very long, so we must take that into account. I remember seeing from uh, one presentation by uh, NIST a few years ago, uh, X plus Y uh, is better than Z. And X being the time when you need to do quantum cryptography, Y being the time you need for deployment, and maybe uh, I make you later a bit, but um, we'll see that in a time. Uh, and uh, and uh, in particular, the threat already exists due to retroactive attacks. So for us, retroactive attacks are slightly uh, wider than only harvesting attacks, because there is another use case. So the first case is the harvest attacks. We are just harvesting data now and decrypting data. The second use case is the case for deploying software, and when you have a mechanism for upgrading software, and then there is a one special case in which there can be retroactive attacks against the authentication of the deployed software. Uh, uh, because the software authentication is verified and the verification algorithm is implemented now, then you can uh, verify now and forth later in some way. So this is a, also a, a case, this is for us a second case of retroactive attacks. So these are the two cases in which we need quantum, we need quantum safe cryptography right now. So what is quantum safe cryptography? Uh, so there are several possibilities to resist uh, mainly short algorithm. So the first case is the extreme position, which is completely to, to remove uh, cryptography, by which I mean to remove computational based, based cryptography completely, and just rely on physical principles. So this means it's TKD. And so for us, our position is very simple. This is completely science fiction. And uh, so not only is this science fiction because TKD is not mature, but also because TKD, even if, uh, if in the most optimistic cases, there are only a limited number of TKDs because basically it only uh, replaces one-time-pass cryptography, more or less. Uh, 
uh, and also because we, as I just said, we need something, uh, we need a replacement now. We don't need a replacement that will work in a few years. And so given the status maturity level of the research on QKD, uh, we don't rely on QKD at all for, uh, uh, for security processes. Of course, we still think that uh, uh, research on QKD devices and so on is very interesting from uh, research point of view. And it could, as usual, have lots of applications. Uh, probably, uh, most of them won't be related to security. Uh, they will be related to communication and bandwidth and so on. We don't expect much, much from that security-wise. Uh, so I, I won't say more about uh, TKD and uh, in this talk. Uh, I think something similar was already said. Uh, so the second point is that the symmetric cryptography is not much effective. So there is a solution, which is the blink ID, and of course it is being related whether this is even necessary. So as a precaution, this, this can be done. It's quite simple and it works uh, um, to generate solutions. Uh, but on the other hand, all classical asymmetric cryptography, anything which is based on discrete localization or factorization, is completely broken. So this needs to be replaced, and the solution, as we all know, is cross quantum cryptography. So what is your role in this? So ANSI is only overseeing everything. We are not, uh, uh, we, we don't have the size to be. Um, uh, a standardization agency, so we are not producing standards, and it is not our role at all to do this. Uh, we are, we have two roles. The first one is that we have an advisory role uh, in which we are um, helping um, companies do uh, safe and security products in general. So we have some uh, national security guidelines. I'm sorry for the fact that they are only in French. Actually, I am the main editor for those, so uh, <laughs> it's just that I don't have the time to translate everything tastefully in English. But given that it is a regular, uh, this is a, also a regulatory text, uh, it's uh, required that it is in French. Um, and we try to uh, keep it up to date with results. Uh, we try to contribute to European guidelines, which are, right now, I believe, not completely up to date with the uh, content uh, cryptography, but we are working on that. And we also have a regulatory role in which we, we oversee the process for security visas, for security for, uh, products which use cryptography. So the analysis are not done by uh, ANSI itself, they are done by a private company, which we oversee, and we also um, we oversee both the, the, the work of the companies and the companies themselves, which are regular. So, um, there you have also the difference with the Stefan. We don't really like uh, keeping up a white list of algorithms, because for us, a security product is much more than the sum of its parts, and we don't want to explicitly give a white list, because then the people just uh, check that they use the correct algorithms and they can make a very bad product with good algorithms. So I don't like so much the term white list, but the spirit is not that different. Uh, because we, for each family of algorithms, for each use case, we give a list of criteria and then there are some algorithms which fit the criteria. So this is, this is the case that, uh, this is how it works for classical photography. Uh, of course, uh, it is still possible to have something unusual which is not in the list, which is not white, which is not in the list. And then uh, each time you reuse a new algorithm for a specific use case, or because of specific constraints and so on, uh, it is still possible to have it approved ad hoc. Uh, so the transition for uh, quantum state cryptography. So the goal is to replace uh, or augment all pre quantum algorithms with equivalent post quantum algorithms. Uh, so we do have two position papers on that. So the first one was setting up the general roadmaps, and now we are entering a, a new phase of, in this, and uh, there is a second paper, uh, which is very recent, as you can see, and uh, which, uh, which explains uh, how the next phase is going on. And we want to do this without security loss at any point, so you guess that I was thinking of a hybrid algorithm to try to uh, And we don't believe in content. So I will do a very uh, quick review of all the various families and diversity of post-quantum algorithms. So you know about lattices, uh, which are uh, which are uh, the most uh, populous family. Uh, codes do share some features of lattices, and then there are some families: uh, multivariate uh, cryptography and uh, isogeny-based cryptography, uh, which currently which have a complicated history. And uh, hash-based signatures, which is a very specific family with specific features. So I don't want to do to spend a lot of time on this, uh, 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 um, except to say a big thank you to Nick for talking all of this and uh, training all of this. So thank you, Nick. But despite all of the work uh, done on this, uh, we don't we don't over, we don't want to overestimate the maturity level of post quantum photography. So the, the work on the algorithm that itself is uh, drawing to a close, let's say, 
and the work on implementing the algorithms is, the, I say, I would say, only beginning, uh, because it's not on, it's not enough to have the right algorithm. Then you need to have a good implementation of the algorithm. We worry a lot about side channel attacks and so on, uh, and uh, even the research on the algorithm itself, it's, uh, it's not over. So we we want uh, we want to, be, to enable. Uh, companies to start implementing post content cryptography, even uh, given the fact that it is not considered by us to be mature enough right now. So, the way for that uh, is, of course, to use hybrid algorithms. So, right now, we are, uh, is there a point on this? Uh, so, we have a, a three phase transition plan uh, in which, in the first part, uh, uh, the pre quantum algorithms are considered safe until the quantum computer exists. But the post quantum, uh, the post quantum um, algorithms are not considered safe yet. So this means that we need to have some overlap at some point between both algorithms. And this uh, NIFI makes some three phases. So in the first phase, first phase is about a defensive depth. And um, in this phase, uh, so currently we are right at the articulation between phase one and phase two. So this is not a complete to date, I'm sorry. We are, uh, we are right now moving between phase, phase one and two. So in phase one, all post-quantum algorithms are considered as exotic, and so they must be hybridized with well-known pre-quantum algorithms. But we, we started a few years ago uh, recommending uh, using post-quantum algorithms uh, whenever data has a long lifetime, by which we mean that uh, any retroactive attacks are possible. Uh, or the data, uh, the data lifetime extends past the time when we expect, uh, so it's, uh, it's, uh, I think you said, uh, 2030, but it's uh, only a guideline. The time when we expect that um, the quantum, um, uh, quantum computer becomes a possibility. So there is a, a hybridization mandate which applies to top level products, not to libraries. So you are allowed, of course, to make a purely post quantum library, but then in many security products, such a version will need to be hybridized. And there is a complete freedom in the choice of post quantum algorithm because it's only a different index. So this was phase one. And uh, in phase one and also in phase two, hybridization is always needed. So hybridization is to combine a pre-quantum and a post-quantum algorithm together by sharing the best features of, of both so that the security level is as good as the best of both. So we will give some examples in this talk. And there uh, we won't find, uh, I think, many differences with the second uh, So of course, this has a cost. The cost is that you need to implement both algorithms, and in general, you need to transfer both data classical and quantum. And so, for us, we, we reckon that the, the main cost is the bandwidth cost, and the bandwidth of uh, generally the larger part is the, is the post quantum algorithm is much bigger than the pre quantum algorithm. So, for us, hybridization has a moderate cost, and it is affordable, uh, in particular as it uh, highly augments the security level for a reasonable cost. So, for this reason, we mandate hybridization uh, at uh, during phase one. We also, so here I would like to thank Steve for uh, speaking about crypto agility. Um, we also uh, think that crypto agility is a very good tool to be able now to leave the spot, to, to leave the room to implement later something post content. So we also like this a lot, uh, a lot and we encourage this. So phase two is, is uh, starting now and uh, it is a phase when you are building confidence in some post content algorithms. So, uh, hybridization remains mandatory, and post quantum safety is uh, generally recommended and can be claimed in some cases. So, uh, right now, we are starting to give a list of accepted post quantum algorithms and a list of criteria. So, the first algorithm I will speak about them later. Uh, but hybridization remains necessary to guarantee non regression. And later, phase three, uh, which could start maybe 2030, maybe earlier. Uh, so uh, it's uh, I, I wrote a good letter on equal, but uh, take that as an approximate letter on equal, whatever this means. Uh, in phase three, some post quantum algorithms will be uh, accepted without hybridization, uh, and in most cases, we will expect that the post quantum safety will become mandatory. So now the technical part, uh, the list of the algorithms. So for key exchange, uh, the algorithms that are right now recommended by uh, ANSI are uh, Crystal Fiber or uh, MLChem uh, and Prodochem and uh, for, uh, I mean for lattice-based uh, cases. Uh, we do have some particular recommendations to start to, uh, to stay close to the standardization. So of course, 
Christoph Schreiber with this underlying by me, probably I'm not, uh, but it is being discussed uh, at uh, ISO, and we hope that it will eventually become an ISO standard, so there will be something to use, and use the highest possible security level. Uh, and of course, uh, use the um, actively secure by, by which we mean the CCP secure, uh, secure version. So for uh, Crystal Skybear, there is one in the NIST uh, process, and uh, I think the NIST submission for Codecam also included this. For lattice based signatures, uh, there are two uh, main candidates, which are Dilithium and Falcon. Uh, so there are lots of differences between both of them, and in particular, implementing Falcon is very hard. Implementing Falcon for is very hard. Uh, so we expect that uh, Dilithium will be used in, one, in most cases, but we also have some advice about Falcon, which is very close to the advice that we had about uh, lattice based uh, switching. And basically, do not modify the parameters, take those to the standard and so on. And this is just to help in the parameters. And also uh, hash based signatures is a special case. So here you won't find a difference, I hope. Uh, hash based signatures do have a security proof. So we consider them right now to be as secure as uh, classical algorithms. But there are only signatures, and they are also very complicated to use. Uh, because some of them are stateful, and the other ones are very big. And the stateful one, they do have a, a very nice use case, which is, uh, I spoke about it in the beginning, software upgrades. Because software upgrades, by nature, they are stateful, and this is not something that you do every day, usually. Uh, maybe you do it every day, but uh, you, 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 can, uh, you can tell in advance how many uh, um, uh, bounds on the number of software upgrades. So, this uh, seems like the ideal use case for uh, hash based signatures. Uh, so, hash based signatures, there is uh, the stateful uh, version, uh, which is uh, XMSS or LMS. There are uh, two main candidates, and uh, one which is stateless. And uh, the use cases for both of them are, uh, we expect them to, be, to have a different use cases. Uh, of course, the fact that uh, some of them are stateful is very complicated for uh, implementation, it was already discussed slightly. Uh, the main roadblock here is that it is impossible to duplicate the, to, it is impossible to copy the private key, because then you have a very big security concern. So it is impossible to make a, safety, a backup copy of a private key, and this causes lots of problems in practice. Uh, so, uh, no difference in this case either. We also accept as a stopgap measure uh, the four-man stabilization, which is a hybridization between classical and pre shared key. Uh, in some cases, so uh, this means the, this is secure as long as the pre-shared key is secure. Uh, and this is mainly falling back to symmetric cryptography. So this is only a stopgap. Uh, this has very, uh, very big constraints. It can only be used as a temporary measure while waiting uh, for uh, something uh, post-quantum. And uh, in a crypto agile solution, where you will eventually replace or supplement the pre-shared key by a, a proper post-quantum algorithm. But for now, it is a possible solution. For confidentiality, how do we hybridize? So there are lots of ways to do hybridization for confidentiality. When you when you want to combine some, uh, so this is also something that was discussed. When you want to combine two key two uh, key encapsulation, uh, one class, let, let's say one classical and uh, one uh, post quantum, how do you combine them? So the simplest way is just to concatenate them, which is cat. Then you can do absorb of them. You have a lot of different ways. And uh, we think that the the three best ones are the the three uh, which are uh, in CCS secure. And uh, as an example, uh, the CAT and KDF uh, is in the draft for TLS uh, 1.3, and uh, Cascade, actually both of them, uh, are present in the RFC for uh, IQ. Uh, so, uh, proof work is still ongoing, it is uh, CCA secure with conditions and so on, so um, there is still some theoretical work to be done on this, but we have a, uh, we start to, to have a nice view of how it will shape out, and uh, we believe that the, in particular the last three lines are. The best ID. Uh, dual PRF uh, is, uh, is very nice, but uh, we don't exactly know what a dual, uh, correct dual PRF looks like right now. So there are still some theoretical uh, robots to why it is not uh, standardized yet. So this is, uh, uh, for, uh, so this, uh, this is the last slide for uh, authenticity. Hybridization is very easy. So you have to combine signatures, just concatenate those signatures. And then it is impossible to form as long as one of them is in but of course, as, is, as uh, always, uh, there, there is a but. But you need to, when you evaluate the product, you need to check that the product is verified in nature. Actually, does verify both in nature. Not a product. Uh, if claims like this, they are not uh, satisfied. So 
Uh, this is the final warning to say that uh, everything that claims to be done by a product must be checked very closely and uh, must be monitored very closely. And therefore, for me. Thanks, uh, Jerome. Uh, we have one question uh, from the online community, and then we can take one question from the audience here. Let's start with the uh, online question. Uh, it's a technical question. Could you explain what is pre shared symmetric key and how do you set up? Oh, uh, let's say that you want to do a, you, you want to do a key exchange, and then you can do a, a UCDH key exchange, and both parties have a, already now a, a set a private key, and when, um, when they do the key exchange, they use uh, both the secret derived from uh, the DCM manager and uh, and also they input the private key to, to ensure in a way that that ensure that uh, somebody that uh, breaks the DCM manager is not able to to recover the shared secret at the end. So the shared secret depends on both uh, the already known secret but, uh, and the the uh, of both the shared secret and the DCM manager in a way that guarantees both that there is a um, uh, there is a perfect forward secrecy when you don't break the shield man, and also that uh, when you break the shield man, there is no longer perfect forward secrecy, uh, but uh, you still need to know the secret. I cannot see the, uh, the response from the uh, online community, but... Uh... Hi, thank you for the talk. I have a question that also goes to the DSI and probably also to the, to the next speaker. Why does it always have to be NIST defining standards and running the competition? So this is nothing against NIST, they did a great job. But um, I think even the European Union was asked if they want to run it because this had the scandal at that time and it was maybe not the best point in time to start a competition. And, uh, uh, so as I said earlier in the talk, we are not a standardization agency. Uh, this is historical. We are not produced uh, any uh, standard protocol. Uh, uh, I really want to thank Thank you for starting a bit earlier that we would have started this ourselves, actually. Uh, to have a, they, they did push uh, all the timeline, uh, uh, they, they, they were very active on this and uh, we want to thank them for that. And once they started the competition, I think there was no point to start another one because I, I, I would have put a, a relevant specificity on this. They are at least tight right now, but. Um, Yes, but then you have the, the case of the competitive standard uh, in the city. You have a lot of uh, different standards and different standardizations for the more or the same name, a different standard version of the uh, server, for example, in the individual server. Let's rephrase this. Are European agencies considering to set up a European institution that can actually host something like such competition in the future? I don't think so. Uh, right now, for example, our efforts are, uh, I mean by uh, MC, but I think that, uh, I, I hope that uh, some of the European colleagues will agree on that. Our efforts are uh, directed on the saving protocol and um, making it a nice standard. And there is a, there is, there does exist a perfectly fine international standard organization. And uh, I think it is the role of ISO to, also to, to have a, to have a cryptographic standard. And we are trying to make some sort of game into a nice standard. If we are not ourselves a standardization agency, we don't have the need for this. Thank you. I also think that is a nice topic for the panel later. Thanks, uh, Jerome. In today's complex, fast-paced world, you need a partner who can help secure your digital transformation so you can drive your business forward confidently. Someone who can fine-tune and integrate the secure technologies that enable mobile identities, digital payments, and a hybrid workforce. You need a partner who will have your back so you can stay focused on the road ahead and accelerate your organization's growth. Entrust, securing a world in motion.